Hi everyone, I'm Chris Melton. I'm your Texas Sake Specialist, and today we're going to be focusing on the Takachio 59 Chapter 10. The Takachio series is really pretty interesting, and we get a chance to almost like taste these every year. They're kind of a pre-sale opportunity for us at Serendipity. These sakes get released typically in the fall, and they're what's called a Maroka Nama Genshu. So if we start breaking all these terms down individually, this can give you some insight into just what makes these sakes special. So as we mentioned, Takachio 59, of course, is the name of the sake itself. This is from Niigata Prefecture, focusing primarily on water used from melted snow in the brewing process. The 59, in this case, uh, means that the sake rice has been polished down to 59% of its original size, meaning 41% of the rice has been eliminated, getting us closer and closer to that starchy center and eliminating those elements in the rice that lead to savoriness in your sake. Now, Maroka Nama Genshu. Let's start with Maroka. Maroka is basically telling you that this sake has not gone through an activated charcoal filtration process, right? It can still be barrier filtered, whether that's a paper filter or otherwise, but it has not been aggressively filtered using activated charcoal in this case. So that's the Maroka. Nama, in this case, is short for Namazake. Namazakes are sakes that are completely unpasteurized, right? So these sakes basically come out of the tank and then go straight into the brewing process and then bottling without going through any pasteurization whatsoever. The last part, of course, is what we call Genshu, G-E-N-S-H-U. Genshu sakes are non-water corrected sakes. And that illicitly implies that most sakes are. I mean, sakes that finish fermentation normally are around 20 to 21% alcohol by volume. Then they go through a water correction or a dilution process to bring that alcohol down to somewhere between about 15 and 17%. This sake has not gone through that dilution process, so it is the full strength of the alcohol that comes out of the fermentation tank. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it is high alcohol. It just means that its alcohol level post-fermentation reached a level that didn't need to be diluted. So that process of water correction was completely skipped. So that's what's making the sake extremely special if you think of the fact that most sakes are activated charcoal filtered, most sakes are pasteurized, and most sakes are diluted. This is basically what sake would taste like directly out of the fermentation tank. Now, what makes the chapter series even more interesting is that each one of the chapters is focusing on a different rice or blend of rices. So we have chapters one through 10 normally. Uh, each of those rices is either an individual rice that's grown nearby by a very, um, very small farm that's supplying the rice for these sakes. This particular chapter, which is chapter 10, is what's called the Ai Ipon. I, in this case, is short for Ayama, and Ipon, in this case, is short for Iponjime. So they're using Ayama rice, which is an extremely rare sake rice made in tiny, tiny quantities. They're also using Iponjime rice. Iponjime rice is kind of an heirloom rice as well in this part of Japan. So they've chosen to blend sakes made from these two rices individually into the chapter 10. And the chapter 10 is directly a blend of what we know as the chapter one, right, which is the Ayama sake. It's also a blend of the chapter two, which is the Ipon Jime. So we put those two sakes together, we bottle them, and we call it our Ai Ipon. So a little bit about where, you, where this sake belongs, either in the course of the meal or particular customers that may be interested. This sake certainly is very limited in its production. Most sake that's uh, unpasteurized, undiluted, and of course non-charcoal filtered is sake that has a little bit of a limited shelf life um, due to the pasteurization especially. So this sake is very rare. Uh, it has to be refrigerated, uh, not only from the point it leaves the brewery to its uh, transportation overseas to us here in the States, and certainly we must also store it refrigerated, and our customers must store it refrigerated as well. So this is a sake that is meant to be an opportunity for our customers to showcase what unadulterated sake tastes like, right? Sake that can be right out of the tank. So this sake is extremely fresh. Texturally, it's very lively. Uh, it has a lot of real bright tropical fruit notes, especially strawberry and watermelon. So this sake has to be kind of almost contoured to a meal where it is the star of the show. And that can mean a lot of food elements, especially traditional Western foods, will overpower this sake in many ways. We have to focus on dishes or customers that are going to kind of give this sake the respect it deserves by pairing it alongside dishes that are very, very delicate. Um, 
not dishes that require uh, a lot of grilling or smoking or heavily salted dishes or spicy dishes. But this is meant to go with more leaner white fish notes, uh, things like flounder or halibut. Uh, certainly does great with things like sashimi, but not dishes that are super fishy, right? When we think about fish oil and things like that, um, those can make the food cover up the notes that make the sake extremely, extremely interesting. So this sake, although is a very rare thing, we also have to treat it with some care with regards to what we pair it with.